New London School Explosion Oil and gas are East Texas's great mineral blessings. Without them, the school would not be here, and none of us would be learning our lessons. This was a message on the blackboard in the New London Consolidated School in Northwest Russ County, Texas. During the 1930s, when the economy of the United States of America was crippled by Great Depression that left millions jobless, the oil and gas made the small town of New London the island of prosperity. The supply of the black gold was abundant and the money was pouring in. Paradoxically, the same thing that brought well-being to New London caused one of the greatest tragedies in Texas history. While New Londoners enjoyed the fruits of their work, the disaster came out of nowhere and took away their greatest treasure, their children. Welcome to Dark History, where we unravel the most disastrous events in history. If you want to support the channel, consider subscribing and like this video. Just a decade before the disaster, the village of New London was hardly known to anyone outside the Northwest Russ County. Then, in 1930, oil was discovered in Kilgore, just a few miles away, and changed the town's life for good. It was the early 1930s, and the county's economy was on its knees. People were looking for any kind of job that would put food on the table. New London was not only offering them an opportunity to work, but a living standard unthinkable at the time. Soon, men from all over the states moved to East Texas. Towns and villages in the area, including New London, bloomed. Tax incomes and revenues from oil fields allowed the East Texans to expand their communities and invest in their children's future. One landmark of East Texas prosperity was the New London School. Built around 1932, it was one of the most modern schools in the entire country. The school campus spread on 21 acres and had separate buildings for high school and the elementary school. A gymnasium and a lighted football field, the first such in East Texas. The campus was dominated by a large junior-senior high school building designed in California Spanish style. An E-shaped building made of steel and concrete was an impressive and sturdy construction. The cost of the building was estimated at $1 million, around $19 million in today's money. The citizens of New London built the school to last for ages. They spared no money for the welfare of their children. Life was rosy indeed in New London. No one even suspected that the disaster was about to happen that would paint it black. March 18, 1937 was a coldish spring day. It was Thursday, a school day. Students were eager to finish their classes as they had a long weekend coming. An interscholastic meet was to be held on Friday in the town of Henderson, so everyone got a day off. Teachers already sent students of the elementary school home. There were only high school students present in the building along with their teachers, some 600 of them. Not far away from the main building, a PTA meeting was held in the gymnasium. A group of older students attended a class of manual training on the basement floor. That day, their teacher Lemmy R. Butler was scheduled to teach them how to use a sander. It was 3.17 p.m. when he switched it on. A moment later, a deafening explosion shook the town and everyone within four miles. Those who witnessed the explosion couldn't believe what they saw. The entire building bulged and lifted in the air before it collapsed into a massive pile of rubble. There was no fire, just a huge white cloud of dust settling over a place where a school used to stand. A deadly silence occurred. Buried under a heap of steel and concrete were students and their teachers. The first to react were parents who attended the PTA meeting in the gymnasium. Many of them had their children in school when the explosion happened. They ran toward the school and started to move debris with their bare hands, looking for survivors. Minutes later, firefighters arrived and joined the rescue operations. The news of the explosion spread quickly. Parents from nearby towns rushed to the scene to look for their children and clogged the roads to New London. Within an hour, the school campus was full of people clearing the site. Oil field workers brought in heavy equipment to remove large parts of debris. It immediately became apparent that the scale of the disaster was enormous. Governor James V. Allred declared martial law five miles within sight. Highway patrol officers, Texas Rangers, and National Guard units arrived to help the rescue operation and maintain the order in the town. Doctors and nurses also came to help the survivors. Unusually, there was no uproar on the site. Shocked by the terrifying images of torn apart bodies, Hundreds of men cleared the ruins in complete silence. 
Floodlights were brought from oil fields and were installed to keep the rescue operation going through the night. Rescuers were tireless. For 17 straight hours, they were clearing the site until they finally did the job. The bodies they pulled out from ruins were lined up along the fence where medical workers checked their status. Those lucky to survive were transported to nearby hospitals. Most of the survivors were taken to Mother Frances Hospital in Tyler. The hospital was planned to be open the day after, but in given circumstances, it started to work immediately. Unfortunately, the number of dead was piling up with each hour of the rescue operation. Improvised morgues were set up in the school campus where parents could have identified their children. The identification process was complicated as most bodies were either burned by the explosion or disfigured by the weight of debris they were buried under. In agony, parents fought over body remains, unable to fully recognize their children. The final death toll of the disaster was between 296 and 319 dead. The number was probably even higher. Many parents took away their kids without reporting their identity. Of those who survived, 130 ended with light injuries. Almost all of them were located in the parts of the building most remote to the center of the explosion. The majority of the students were buried at the local cemetery. An entire section was designated for the victims. Letters of condolence arrived from the whole country and abroad. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt was among the first to express her grief. A letter came from German Chancellor Adolf Hitler as well. Three days after the explosion, after all the victims were buried, Governor Allred ordered a full investigation of what led to the tragedy. One million dollars invested in building the London School showed there was no cutting off expenses on account of the quality of works. However, when it came to installing the heating system, the school board opted for a cheaper version. Instead of a boiler and a steam heating system as planned by the architects, 72 individual gas steam heaters were installed in rooms throughout the building. Such a system was not unusual for the period, but the problem was that the building was not designed for it. Most gas piping ran through the basement, which had no proper ventilation. It was a fatal mistake. After the gas heating system was installed, the school signed a contract with the United Gas Company to supply natural gas. Two months before the disaster, the school board decided to end the contract and connect to residue lines of the Parade Gasoline Company. Switching to residue gas was yet another measure to cut down the expenses. Residue gas was a byproduct of oil extraction. Oil companies had no use of it and would usually flare it off. Because of this, they allowed unauthorized connections to users who often preferred to use this gas for their needs. After all, it was free. The problem with this unrefined or wet gas was that its quality was inconsistent and asked for appropriate valves and pipe connections. When the school switched to residue gas, they hired a contractor to modify the existing pipelines. The modification was not done by a proper specialist, as there were no authorized engineers for the job. If there was, one would surely notice the faulty connections that caused the gas to leak. In the first two months after the school installed the new system, there was a constant leakage of gas. Since natural gas was colorless and odorless, there was no way for anyone to determine something was going wrong. There were frequent reports of headaches and nausea in that period, but no one connected it to gas leaking. Without proper ventilation, the gas accumulated in a dead space between the foundation and the basement floor. When Mr. Butler switched on the sander, a spark ignited the gas in the air and spread the flame toward the gas trapped in the dead space. The explosion was so strong that it tore down the building. A part of the concrete block weighing two tons was thrown on a car parked 200 feet away from the building. At the end of the day, it was a desire to cut the expenses that led more than 300 kids to death. Families of the victims eventually sued the school district and the parade gas company, but both were relieved from charges. The court decision was caused mainly by the lack of material evidence that was clear during the rescue operation. The tragedy ended with no one to answer for it. However, the scale of the disaster forced the state of Texas authorities to make significant changes in the state legislature that would prevent similar tragedies from happening in the future. The first was the decision to add malodorants to natural gas. In this way, gas received a strong and unpleasant smell so that leakings could be easily detected. The practice proved to be very effective and soon spread worldwide. The second change was the introduction of the Engineering Registration Act. 
The act ensured that only persons to whom the state of Texas issued a license were allowed to perform engineering jobs. As for the New London School, the classes continued two weeks after the disaster. Students who survived it finished the year in improvised classrooms. Life went on in New London. Its citizens learned to live with their tragedies. In memory of their beloved children, they erected a centigraph across the school campus. Eighty years later, it still reminds people of the worst school disaster in U.S. history. I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please like and subscribe. See you next time.